YouTube. I'm Ricky Baltimore and welcome to the Home Winemaking Channel. Let's go talk about some wine. Alright, we made it here to the winemaking area of my basement where all the magic happens and the rubber meets the road. Um, so today, what, what I really want to talk about is if you want to get into winemaking, what equipment do you really need to buy? Um, I know there's kits out there, but say you want to formulate your own kit, this will help you right here. So the first thing I want to start with is the primary fermenter. So let me grab something here. The primary fermenter. This might also be known as a bucket to a lot of you guys. Um, but really what this is, is just a six gallon, some of them are seven gallon food grade bucket. Um, this is where you're going to start your wine. The main thing about these is you're going to need some headspace because the wine likes to bubble up pretty hard uh, when it starts out. And if you were to start your wine in uh, something like this without a lot of headspace, you might end up with a complete volcano. And trust me, I've been there and I think a lot of other people have been there too and would probably advise you to do something like this. Um, and honestly, nothing special about it. If you have a food grade container that um, it has some headspace, doesn't have to seal tight. You're gonna have so much CO2 on the wine when you start, not a big deal. Um, you should be able to get started. You can find these on Craigslist, probably for $5. A lot of guys have a lot of extras laying around. Um, I'm sure you can buy them on the winemaking websites, um, Amazon, but you're gonna pay closer to maybe $15. But again, nothing special, just a food grade bucket. So uh, the next thing, I'll try to talk in some kind of order that makes sense, but the next thing is the uh, a couple testing pieces. So this is one of the most, most important and useful things if you're getting started out in wine. And what we have here is a hydrometer. So this is a triple scale hydrometer. What that means is you, you fill this up with your wine, you float it, or in the case of a bucket, maybe you just drop it in your wine. And uh, what it'll tell you is the specific gravity of your wine. Uh, it'll also tell you the potential alcohol and also the percent sugar, which uh, in winemaking they call bricks. Um, pretty, pretty important because if you don't know the specific gravity when you start your wine, you really have no idea how much alcohol your wine is gonna make. And when you get some juice, you, you really don't always know what you're dealing with. So you always take your hydrometer, you drop it in. Everybody who's making wine needs a hydrometer. So uh, the next step, the carboy. So these last things here, some people call them a secondary fermenter or carboy. Um, they're glass, the ones I have are glass. You can get them in plastic. Uh, plastic is a little bit lighter. These things can be a little bit heavy when they're full. Um, but I like glass because um, you can clean it. You don't have to worry about it. if it's plastic, it could get scratched. Um, the only fallback is if, if you were to drop a glass one or tip one over, you're gonna have a mess on your hands and it's, it's not gonna be good. Um, but again, I like the glass. So on top of the glass carboy, uh, you have your bung right here. So I have one here to show you. That there is a bung. Uh, and also your fermentation trap, or some people call it a bubbler. So what this does is it just kind of keeps the air out, allows the CO2 to escape during a fermentation, but it keeps the air out. Um, these are just a couple dollars. Get them down at the brew store, get them online. Um, carboys, you can, honestly, if you can find carboys used, that's the way to go. At a yard sale on the Craigslist. Uh, if you can find a carboy for 10 to $15, you're talking pretty good deal. Uh, if you were to buy one brand new locally, you're probably looking $25 to $35, depending on the size. And uh, unfortunately, you get a lot of people trying to sell these things used and they're asking $50 and they won't even take $35 and you can buy them brand new. So just tell those people no if they're asking that kind of money. This thing here, this is what I call a wine journal. I'm not much of a journal kind of guy, but when it comes to wine, you really need a journal. I don't care what anyone says. You think you're going to remember this stuff, but 
when you have a wine that you made two years ago, didn't taste that good when you made it, now it tastes amazing, you want to remember what you did. You want to remember what yeast you used. You want to remember the temperature you fermented at. Um, you know, how long did you ferment it? Did you oak it? What did you do to that wine? So you want a wine journal and you're going to want to take a lot of notes um, to just honestly record everything you can record. You can't record too much in this situation. Another testing piece, pretty handy. Um, not 100% maybe the first thing you should buy, but pretty quickly, I have this little um, laser thermometer and uh, I can shine it at my wine here, 70 degrees right now. Uh, when you're very first fermenting, the temperature is actually relatively important. If you ferment too, too hot or too cold, um, too cold you could have problems with your yeast, but a lot of times you might want to ferment cold because you might want to really retain those flavors. So um, just a good thing to have so you can record that in your little log book. Um, another piece of equipment, again, if you think you're going to stick with it, buy it. They're cheap and I can't say that it's as accurate as a lab grade pH meter, but this is a pH meter. Um, you can get these for about $10. It'll at least give you the ballpark of uh, how acidic is the wine that you're dealing with. Should you add acid? Um, are you good to go? And as a starter, this is a quick and easy way. There's other methods to dig a little deeper, but a good piece of uh, labware to kind of start with. Um, as far as you look at these things, you, you notice here I've got a couple different kinds of traps. I've got a trap here that's kind of shaped like an S. Um, let's see, I'll grab one here. And then I've got a trap. So you've got your S trap, you got your trap that has kind of a little cup inside. So you say, well, what kind of trap should I buy? Um, honestly, it's really up to you. Personally, I like these S traps. Um, as they fill up with water, it kind of pushes it to the side. It's easy to kind of tell as it's bubbling still. Um, if it were to dry out, it would have to dry out almost completely before you would ever have to worry about any air getting back into your wine. Whereas these ones here, um, if it even partially dries out, um, say half dries out, you might have to worry about air getting in your wine. Air is definitely your enemy. Um, it's probably one of the leading causes of wine problems, um, especially as a newbie and you're, you know, you're just kind of learning things. Um, so next, let's talk about, you've got your carboy, you've got your primary fermenter. How do you get your wine from your carb or from your primary fermenter to your carboy? And um, what you're going to need to do that is a racking cane. So this, you just basically siphon the wine out. All these racking canes usually come with a little uh, piece on the bottom, so you don't really suck up a lot of the sediment as you transfer. Um, you can kind of leave that be on the bottom. I've got a handful of different canes here. I've got an auto siphon there um, that you can try. The auto siphon, personally, um, if I were to advise anybody, and everyone has their own opinion on this, but I have this thing, I never use it, honestly. Um, I always gravitate to one of a couple of these racking canes. If I want to rack fast, I use the half inch. Um, if I'm actually trying to not be so fast, like say I'm bottling, I don't want to overwhelm myself and that bottle's filling up too fast, um, I'll use a 5 16 uh, So if you're gonna buy a racking cane, I'd say buy a 5 16 um, I honestly buy a stainless steel one if you can because they're not that much more money and these the plastic ones if you're if you're gonna stick with it you're probably gonna eventually break your racking cane um, they're not the most durable things on the planet so um, get a stainless steel one you're looking at like ten twelve dollars and um, it'll last you your whole life if you're gonna stick with the hobby so uh, a little add-on that goes on to a racking cane is a bottle filler um, I have a couple over here so a couple of different kinds of bottle fillers. Um, this one here, you can see, you press this, wine comes out, you let go, it stops. This one's not spring-loaded, just kind of dangles here. Um, there's spring-loaded ones which I have, but I really like these, these basic ones um, where you just kind of press it and you lift and it shuts off. And the reason I like these ones is you don't really need to like apply any force to get the wine to flow, you can just drop it in the bottle, let go, put your cork on your last bottle, do what you need to do. 
Um, whereas the spring-loaded ones, you're kind of manually pressing it down. And if you want to kind of multitask, you really can't. It's a little bit harder. So you're always kind of pressing this, just waiting, sitting there staring at it. And just get the, get the cheap ones without the spring. That's what I would recommend. All right, so we've almost covered all the, like, the basic equipment that you need. Um, there's one more thing that you can use here. And this here is um, a wine thief. So they make metal ones of these. They make ones with kind of suction bulbs on top, which I'd call a glorified turkey baster. Um, I have a glass one. I think it's cool looking, but I can't really say any reason why you want the glass over the metal. In reality, um, I'm sure if I look at this thing wrong, it's going to break, so I have to take really good care of it. So it's up to you what kind of wine thief you want. If you have a turkey baster, um, That'll probably get you by for a while until you really want to spend the money because honestly, these things aren't that cheap. Um, but yeah, that's the very most basic equipment. So I'll do a quick run through right now. Um, primary fermenter, which is a bucket. Uh, at the scale you're working in, it's just a bucket. And just make sure it's food grade. Um, it doesn't even need a tight fitting lid. You could put a towel over it. You just want to keep the fruit flies out of it at this point. You've got so much CO2 on the wine, you don't have to worry about it. So primary fermenter. Um, wine journal, very important, very simple. Uh, hydrometer, thermometer, um, pH meter. Um, if you're gonna prioritize one, get the hydrometer. It's six, seven dollars. Um, don't skimp on the hydrometer. Uh, next, carboy. Definitely need some carboys. I like the glass, some people like the plastic. It's up to you, it's your choice. Um, racking cane, hose. Uh, bottle filler, uh, you will actually need some bottles, um, obviously. Wine cork, or wine uh, thief. And one thing I forgot to mention is obviously some, some wine corks here. So these corks are nothing special. These are the, con I think they're called conglomerate or agglomerate or something. You can get um, natural cork, it's a little classier. Um, synthetic cork is probably the least likely to cause you any trouble, but you're going to pay a little bit more for it. Um, I get these because you can get a hundred of them for like 12 bucks. And you know, you're making wine because you want to make it, but part of the reason people make wine is because you're looking at two or three dollars a bottle to make a bottle of wine and saving money and a dollar saved is a dollar earned. I've heard of that. I don't know if it's true, but I think it is. All right, one last thing here. You got your corks, got everything else. Now you need a way to put those corks in the bottle. Um, I've got two styles of corkers here, the lever acting corker. This is a Portuguese corker. There's an Italian corker, basically the same thing, a little bit larger. Um, I really like these ones. They do a really good job of putting the cork in the bottle. Um, you can get this kind a little cheaper. Um, it works okay, but a lot of times if you don't really commit to it, um, it just won't won't really seep that cork in it. And it also kind of wrecks the cork a little bit, especially if you're using a natural cork. So I've got two bottles here, so I can kind of show you the difference between the two. But um, this one here, you can see that's from the, the lever action corker. And this one here is from the little hand operated corker. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'll take the lever acting one all day and it's, you know, 60 bucks versus maybe 30. So if you're gonna stick with it, get this corker and it'll treat you good.